I'm going to talk about data integration. Um, and some of this material is reused from a course that a lot of the material from this workshop is, is used from uh, that Tulula helped uh, develop. Um, so thanks, Tulula. Uh, and um, so the, the topic of this last uh, uh, section is data integration. Um, and by the end of this lecture, you will understand the difference between batch correction and data integration, when and how to use data integration methods, uh, knowing how to evaluate how well your data integration methods are working on your data, um, how popular data integration methods work, and to we're going to focus on conceptual knowledge to um, understand um, the data integration method examples that will be in the lab section. So in the lab section, we have um, like a, a work, uh, a notebook that you can run through. Um, we're not going to ask you to do a lot of coding and just kind of going through it. So um, there's a bunch of notes in there, but um, the lecture is will be focused. So it, it will just kind of give you a sense of how things are working. Um, and uh, the concepts will mostly be focused in the uh, on in the lecture. Okay, so the motivation is that we want to frequently combine samples and analyze them jointly. Um, so if you only have one sample, you do not need to worry about this lecture. <laughs> but if you have more than one sample, then this is important. Um, so um, typically each sample gets normalized and then it frequently by itself. Um, and then somehow you need to merge the information to, to do a joint analysis. Um, however, one of the major problems that occurs is that um, sometimes this merging doesn't work well. And one of the biggest issues that comes up is that there's a batch effect. So here's an example of a terrible batch effect. So these are um, three blood samples assayed with different 10x genomics technology platforms, uh, the five prime, three prime, V1 and V2 chemistries. And you can see that, um, you know, each all the expected cells that are should be in the blood are visible, like T cells. But then you know there's three T cell clusters that come up, and you know ideally these shouldn't be separated so much. They're all T cells, um, and each uh, the, the the three experiments are colored with the three different colors. Um, so batch effect uh, can be corrected, and just as an example, if we run Harmony, which is a, pretty common batch effect, uh, batch correction method or data integration method. I'll, I'll talk more about how all that works. You can you can solve this problem and all the T cells then group together from all the samples. And now you can cluster this data and a cluster will represent a cell type or a, sub, or a subtype. Um, so um, merging is, is uh, the idea that you just combine the data sets and batch correction means that you have to apply some batch correction method. Um, and um, so what's the difference between these? So, and, and why would you do one versus the other? So, um, so merging, as I mentioned, just simply joining everything together um, frequently and, and usually you normalize your data. Sometimes that can make a difference in how well things merge well together. And sometimes the merging works great and you don't need to do any batch correction. So you actually have to evaluate um, the data before deciding. So what is a batch effect? How do you know that you have a batch effect in the data? So generally that the idea of the word, you know, the phrase batch effect is that samples are clustering by batch and batch is the set of samples that are run together um, in, in some way, like run on the same date. Um, and a batch is a technical confounder that should be removed from the data, um, especially if it's stronger than the signals that you're interested in. So for instance, if we're interested in cell types um, here, we would like the cell types to be to, to group together, but because batch effect is so strong, it's actually grouping by batch instead of by cell types. So the batch effect is stronger than the cell type effect and the clustering algorithm is just gonna group things by batch effect because it just groups things based on the strongest signal in the data. Um, and um, uh, so does my data have a batch effect? So there's a number of ways that you can tell. The one that I showed you is a very obvious one. And the 
the uh, example that I provided where you're kind of looking for cells to, the cells that you know are of the same type to overlap in the in the visualization. That's a, a really good way of testing if you have a batch effect, if that's the cells of the same type are not grouping together um, without, uh, you know, naturally, then probably you might have a batch effect. Um, um, so if the data sets are completely separated upon merging, that's like in the previous slide, that's a, a good, a good, uh, get, uh, you know, um, uh, signal that there's a batch effect. Um, and, uh, even if there's some subtle systematic, mm -hmm. subtle, but systematic separation. So systematic means that it's affecting every, all the cells in a sample in the same way, like the samples are shifted something, even if they're somewhat overlapping. So there's probably a batch effect because, um, you know, it's a sample level, uh, effect. Um, so if, um, and as I mentioned, if, if merging works well, and like there's no batch effect, then, um, you know, your joint analysis probably will, will be fine, uh, without applying a batch correction method. Um, although sometimes when merging your data and applying an analysis on it, um, sometimes people will ask you to prove that integration is not needed because batch effects are so frequently encountered. It's a frequent, it's a common reviewer question in publications um, to say, oh, well, you know, how do you know your result is not just due to a batch effect and you kind of have to prove that. Um, so I'll go through a lot of uh, additional information related to these things. So just as as one example, um, I'll show you a couple of examples from, from our own work. So we um, published a, a, a map of the human liver um, a number of years ago uh, we had five samples at the time, and um, this was the resulting map. And we didn't need, we, it turns out we didn't need batch correction. The merge was sufficient. Um, we had, however, it was a little bit complicated because we had some sample specific variation. Eventually we, you know, we, we um, presumed that it was biological. So if we visualize this by sample. You can see that um, there's quite a few clusters that uh, you know, all the samples are all mixed nicely, but some of the clusters are sample specific and there are some pretty big ones, right? So you might think, oh, maybe there's a batch effect here because there's, you know, one sample is separating out from all the rest. Um, but what we felt was happening was that it was just unique cells from a sample that were not represented in other samples. And the main reason why we thought that is because quite a lot of the clusters are actually nicely overlapping. Actually, all the immune cells were nicely overlapping and all the hepatocytes and some other liver cell types were not. And um, because we know that those cells are highly, might be expected to be variable because at least for hepatocytes in the liver, they're talking to the environment a lot and they uh, might change their um, state a lot based on uh, what people are eating or what pe people are ingesting into their body. So we thought, okay, maybe there could be a good biological reasons for hepatocytes to kind of look different in different people. Um, so reviewers asked us to um, prove that that was not a batch effect. Um, and so um, I just put the actual response to the reviewers in here so you can see it. Um, and the main argument that we used is that we tried lots of different batch effects and we tried to regress out all sorts of technical factors like the sample, the library size, the, you know, the gene detection rate, and none of that, no matter what we did, it didn't change the result. Like those hepatocytes were never pushed together. Um, and so, um, you know, while we can't prove that it's not a batch effect, our, you know, um, uh, we, we felt it was likely that, that the donor variability was, um, just because of biological variability. Um, and then we, we would examine, you know, that effect more closely with when we had more samples. So that was, that was, uh, um, uh, the reviewers were comfortable with that. So here's another example, um, with Trevor Pugh and, um, and, uh, uh, we, we, analyzed a, a number of human glioblastoma stem cell lines. And um, without batch correction, you know, all the samples are basically separated. So there's lots of sample specific vari variation. So here as well, 
you know, maybe a batch correction algorithm should be applied. This is like exactly the case that I showed with the PBMCs. In this particular case, um, we found that no batch correction method worked. And we know that because we're working with cancer samples, there's a lot of genomic variation, like whole chromosomes are deleted and amplified. And um, that, that affects gene expression a lot. So, um, you know, in looking at our data, we actually decided that this is actually mostly biological, probably a lot of it actually was explainable by copy number changes, um, with chromosomal variation. Um, and uh, again, we presume that it was biological, but then there, again, the reviewers asked, well, what about batch correction? And so we said, our argument here was we applied three batch correction methods and all of them disagreed with each other. Um, and so, uh, you know, it doesn't appear that, you know, it's possible that the batch correction methods just don't work, but it's also possible that um, there's no obvious batch effect that is easy to correct um, because otherwise the methods would have see, you know, identified it and at least agreed with each other. So um, uh, we also found that the same samples from sampled from like if we took samples from the same patient but different parts of the tumor, that they were much more similar to each other than between individuals. So that was an, another piece of evidence that we used to prove or support the idea that our, our statement or our claim that um, that uh, is probably biological effects between individuals. Um, but you know, again, it's not easy to prove. But again, this was sufficient for the reviewers. So. You know, it's it's that those examples illustrate this kind of tension between, um, like, the the uh, being able to distinguish between biological and technical signals, and actually that's a general problem in in science, right? And we have to think about it frequently on a case by case basis. Um, while, so while there are general patterns to 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 um, observe, like for instance, if there are you know all the samples are completely separated that we should probably say, oh, we should probably ask, is that a batch effect? And we should try to correct with batch correction methods. But if it becomes challenging to do so, there might be something else happening um, and it might be a biological effect um, as a kind of general um, kind of guideline for how to approach it. Okay, so, um, so how to determine if the merge or batch correction worked or it's you know good so um so there's a few kind of there's no easy way to really prove this uh well we can uh, like the last point kind of talks about a more rigorous version but typically what people do is um check for batch effects with a few different criteria i've mentioned a few of them already so one of them is visual inspection of the umap that was what we used for the pbmc map and you just saw the samples separating out completely different spaces. So that that's might be a clue that you have a batch effect. Um, I also mentioned that the um uh the you know T you know the, the cell type should overlap if we expect them to be not different uh, different in in terms of their global gene expression patterns. So um the clusters that we find should make sense and that they represent samples appropriately and that, that they represent cell types and states appropriately. Um, if that's not happening, like you would expect, then um, there might be a problem. So one of the things that we frequently recommend is that you look at samples individually and annotate them, and then you'll have kind of ground truth. Like this sample I know has T cells in it. And when I do the batch correction, if they disappear, then that's not good. Right. Um, or if they, you know, they might be scattered around or if they don't overlap well. So we'll talk about that a little bit um, uh, in a bit as well more, but that that would be like a bad, a bad result from the batch correction. Um, and um, other biological signals that you might know about that are important in the data should make sense as well. Like cell cycle effect is maintained in relation to cells that are known to be cycling. So for instance, if we're working with cancer cells and they're proliferating, that that's something we should know from our prior knowledge um, and um, those bi additional biological signals that we might know about and are, are working with should be maintained. Um, and that these interesting biological signals are not ruined. Like I, I mentioned uh, with cells being potentially removed after batch correction or clusters being removed or they're spread out all over the place or 
they're interfered with by being split up um, in a way that you don't think is well is uh, uh, appropriate. Um, the most rigor so so all of those are kind of none of them really prove that the batch effect is there or not there after you've run it. It's just um, they're kind of uh, tests that you can use to make to you know evaluate that um, it's likely working. You know the batch is there's likely a batch effect there or um, once you apply batch correction and they disappear, that the batch correction method worked. Um, however, the most rigorous way, and that's what most people use in the field, that kind of thing. Um, although the reviewer comments that I included in the previous slides kind of show you some real examples of what happens if you when you try to go publish the work. Um, but the most rigorous version, uh, which um, is to is to understand all of the as many factors in the data as can be found and check all of them for appropriate handling during the batch correction process. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, one of the factors, different factor factors might be cell types. Uh, they're basically biological signals and technical signals in the data. Batch effect is a technical signal. Cell types is a biological signal. Um, and uh, if you understand all the different parts of your data, then you can kind of check that they're not interfered with um, one by one. Okay, so here's um, a merge example where we just are using visual inspection to see if the samples are separating. And if no, then the batch effect is less likely. So I talked about this. This is our liver map with five livers. And um, and I, I kind of already explained that uh, you know, how we evaluated this, right? So a lot of the, the immune cells were all overlapping and some of the hepatocytes weren't and other liver cells. So we thought a batch effect was less likely because, you know, just by merging the data, all the immune cells were nicely overlapping. So if there was a batch effect, they shouldn't, it shouldn't be, you know, they should be separated. Um, another way you can look at it is, uh, are the samples represented across cell types? So we, just looking at the endothelial cells, um, we can see that there's three different types of endothelial cells and we plot them based on samples. So these things at the bottom here, one, two, three, four, five are samples. There are five liver samples. And we can see that the three types of endothelial cells that we were interested in are visible, are present in every sample. Um, and, um, and if there are certain uh, cell types that are found only in one sample, you should investigate those. Um, you know, the, the, the PBMC example that I showed you would have shown this plot as every sample, every cluster is sample specific. So in this particular case, there are some clusters that some clusters that are sample specific. Um, sorry, every, every, yeah, every cluster in the PBMC map would be sample specific. In this, in this case, there are some cells that are well represented across samples and other cell or clusters that are sample specific. So this basically just means let's investigate more. It's not an obvious batch effect. In fact, our, as I mentioned, our interpretation was that it's probably not a batch effect. Um, it's just different, different hepatocytes in different people, um, but um, needs investigation. And a reviewer would look at this and ask you to, 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 to do what we did. Um, so clusters, as we know from the workshop, ideally represent cell types. Um, and ideally there's one cluster per cell type um, and then, um, you know, that's an important signal in the data that we want to make sure is, uh, you know, overlapping appropriately, as I mentioned. Um, so here's an example where we can evaluate that. So you can look at um, the clusters, you can plot the clusters, and here are three samples um, in the PBMC, the, the blood samples that I mentioned, um, and you can see um, that you know, this is this, this the example that I mentioned where they're all different. And now when, after batch correction, we can see that they're now um, like all merged nicely. And, um, and we see that each cluster has representation from all the samples. So before they were all separated and after, after batch correction, they were nicely merged. Um, so, um, so these stacked bar plots are frequently used to um, evaluate these things. Um, you know, here's another example where we have um, uh, clusters which represent cell types or states. Um, and in this case, the, this blue cell type is B cells 
is split up across multiple clusters. And after we um, apply batch correction, it's nicely merged into one cluster. So, um, you know, if you have um, your merge, ver merge version of your data and your batch correct version of your data, applying these stack bar plot visualizations can help you diagnose or test whether things are working well. So in this case, it's these these cases generally working well because the cell types uh, that, that are similar are all merging well together. Okay, so um, so that covers you know how to kind of know that you have a batch effect in your data or not. Um, you shouldn't apply batch correction methods if you don't need to because. Um, batch correction actually changes your data and there are risks associated with it. So um, so one of the risks, if you apply batch correction is you get over or under correction. So um, yeah, so if you don't need to do that, you shouldn't do that because it, yeah, it, it, it comes with some risks. So over correction is the removal of important variation of interest or biological signal of interest. So the Cell cycle might be removed when you're studying stem cells or cancer cells, and that would, that's not good because we're interested in that. Um, cells of different types or states will be merged. Um, samples of different types will be merged between two different tissues that are it's inappropriate, um, and you need to take care to avoid that and you know just know know your data. Some integration methods are more harsh than than others. So um, an, an example that people have found. Um, uh, Surratt's CCA or canonical correlation analysis method has gained a reputation for being harsh and it frequently overcorrects. Sometimes that's useful when you have really strong effects and you really want to overcome them and it actually might be appropriate to use, but frequently it, it ends up being more harsh. So it's good to know that the different um, batch correction methods might be um, more or less prone to some of these, these risks. Um, or undercorrection fails, so that, that's all overcorrection. Um, the other risk is undercorrection, so some of the batch effect is not is maintained. So it's like, you know, the cells are pushed together, but they're still not perfectly overlapping. And again, that sometimes is challenging to resolve because is that still just a residual technical effect, or is it because there's slight differences in the cells between individuals, individual samples? Okay, any questions? Okay, so um, how does batch correction work? So the general idea is that we identify um, similar signals in the data, like cell types, across samples, and we correct the overall data so that those things align with each other. So it's kind of similar to the visual inspection um, tests that I was talking about, or those stack bar plots. This is the algorithm is trying to do that automatically. So it's it's looking for, say, the T cells that are across doesn't know what t doesn't necessarily know what T cells are, but it can tell that they're similar to each other somehow. And if it detects that, then it will say, okay, those need to be overlapping in the UMAP. It doesn't necessarily think about UMAPs, but they need to be overlapping. UMAP is a good visualization of the space of data. Um, and so you can kind of see what's happening if you if you had a UMAP that was animating as, as the as the uh, integration method worked, you'd see that the T cells would be like pulled together, right? So um, the the difference that it, so if it sees that, you know, the T cells should be, are present in multiple samples and they should be pulled together and overlapping, um, it tries to correct all the data based on the differences between those. So it identifies some factor that is different between them, try to, tries to remove them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, I'm just going to uh, talk, uh, give a little bit more background before getting into it. So I mostly talked about batch effects. I mentioned that batch effects are, you know, based on the idea of a batch, which is really an experimental and a, a concept from experimental sample handling, like things get run in batches, but that's just one technical confounder that can affect the data. And there's many others that, that are possible. Um, and actually batch correction works with any of them. Typically um, we call it batch correction just for historical reasons, because way back with microarrays, it was really bad that, you know, samples were run on different days. It was definitely like a major, diff major problem. So batch was, uh, batch correction methods were like very focused on sample batches. 
but um, the methods are actually general. There are other types of technical factors um, and um, a more general term for batch correction is data integration. Um, so data integration is just, you know, saying yeah. that we're going to integrate the data and we're going to figure out how to best do that. It doesn't have to be a batch that separates them. It could be something else. So what are different types of data factors that might affect your data? So um, um, in general, I, I'm going to use this word factor and it's another word for factor is a biological signal. And you can have, or sorry, as a signal in the data, and you can have biological signals or technical signals. Um, and you know, mostly those are visible in the data because let's say we have a gene expression, a cell by gene matrix, we find a whole bunch of genes that are correlated with each other across samples. Um, and um, you know, if they're correlated with each other, that could be caused by um a biological process um, or like for instance those genes are all expressed in the same cell type and those cells are doing things and turning their genes on and off in characteristic ways that the cell types like to do of that cell type but they could also be correlated with each other because they were run on the same day so the general idea of a factor is kind of just a bunch of correlated signals in the data and um, and that that those correlated signals can be caused by different processes that occur in the samples, biological processes, technical processes. It's a physical thing that's occurring to the data that causes things to be correlated. So semantically, the confounding factors are the nuisance ones that we're not interested in. Um, they may be correlated with our factor of interest, in which case they can interfere with it. And that is just not easy to get around. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it can also be confusing, um, but um, I won't talk about that too much as to know that it can occur uh, conceptually. And um, and I mentioned that this it's, you know, these, these things are caused by a process, physical or biochemical, that affects many genes. And that's why they, the, the correlation, they correlate because there's a common cause for what's affecting the genes. So there's some cause that's affecting multiple genes and is pushing them in one way or another, like up, up to be overexpressed. Um, or highly like more read counts to be detected in the experiment. Um, so all of these factors are, you know, interesting ones to think about. Um, technical ones are, you know, tissue storage, how much time I, the, 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 the sample was in the freezer, um, you know, the length of time between, I, like when I took my cells and how, when I measured them. Yeah. Sample under design to help with the batch effects, or is that too cost prohibitive to include? So the question is, do people uh, include a reference sample to consider batch effects? Um, it's a good question. Um, there's been a lot of work on kind of calibration of of uh, experimental of gene expression experiments over time. People used to do, um, and in fact, there's a whole mini field of people who kind of done spike ins to calibrate um, gene expression levels based on standards. And, and people don't use them frequently um, because it turns out that the batch correction methods are fine without them. Like they can consider an, enough data, we can we can solve the problem. Um, and I think, you know, it, 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 the, the more samples you have um, from your experiment, the easier it's gonna be to identify um, signals that are repeated and should be aligned. And so, people mostly focus more on just trying to get more samples. Um, and as time moves on, people, the number of samples in people's experiments gets bigger and bigger because um, the cost hopefully goes down, but also, you know, there's new technologies like multiplexing and that can drive the cost down, but also people are pushing for more um, because it's uh, more reliable, you know, results in the end. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so a lot of different interesting things that can occur, um, that cause these, these correlations, um, and, uh, a batch correction will, um, like if they're very sample specific, they'll hopefully be corrected by, you know, be corrected. And frequently the technical factors are sample specific, um, although biological factors could be, but frequently we expect 
we have replicates, biological replicates, we're going to see the same biological signals over time. We might have different technical signals because of the sample handling or something like that. Um, okay, so I mentioned this word factor. Um, it actually is what you've probably learned a factor is. So way back in, you know, uh, you know, middle school or something, you probably learned that a factor is a number that divides another number evenly. Um, so, you know, these numbers are factors of six. Um, they're kind of like parts of six or different ways of creating six. So um, this, this is expandable to um, matrices um, in math. And in single cell genomics, the cell by gene table is a matrix. Um, and in matrix max, math, you can extract factors and you can think of them as parts of the matrix. So you can um, combine them, you can multiply them back together to make the matrix. Uh, and frequently they're you know, linear components. Um, I don't have to worry about that too much. Um, and um, the, uh, the data within a component are all correlated along a linear axis frequently. So principal component analysis is one way to identify such linear components that you've probably heard of. Um, and in PCA, um, each principal component explains some of the variability in the original data set. And um, you know, usually PC, the first principal component explains the most variability and you know, other ones might explain some additional ones. So you can consider these principal, principal components as factors the data. Um, so data integration aligns these related factors and the there's some assumptions that are common to all of the different data integration methods. The main one is that the biological variability, and I've mentioned this already a couple of times, but the biological variability will be overlapping across your samples and the technical variability will not be necessarily overlapping across your samples. It could, but um, you expect it to be more variable between samples than um, the biological signal. Um, so the main one that is useful in, in single cell genomics is that all the data sets, like we, if we're mapping the liver and we have five livers, well, they, all, they should all have the same, they, we, we should see hepatocytes in all of them. Um, um, it's possible to have linear, nonlinear factors um, and some of the data integration methods use that. So, um, there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about it, but the, it's still conceptually similar in that there's alignment between the factors and um, uh, and that, that those are automatically identified and, and aligned. Um, some of the um, identified factors that the algorithm aligns might be hidden and not extractable, so you might not actually know how it did it. Um, it's not telling you that it's a batch of factor, like this is the you know, signal that I'm removing. Um, and some of the integration methods don't have, some methods allow you to see what's happening um, and uh, in that respect, and some don't. Okay, so there are many, many integration methods. Um, how many people have used data integration already in their single cell data? What method did you use? Harmony, okay, any others? Anybody else? What did you use? Harmony, okay. Anyone anyone use something other than Harmony? Okay, so some people tried some other ones, but um, key take home messages, there are many, many of them, and there's no theory that tells us which one better. In fact, there's a general theory for machine learning that tells us that we can't have a theory that tells us which one's better, and it's called the no free lunch theorem. If you're really interested, it's a bit theoretical, but the, the um, the, the implication is that there's no single way to uh, create a general analysis uh, like of, of a data set uh, where you're doing like clustering, machine learning, or data integration. They're all related problems. There's no single best method that works across every possible data set that could be created. Um, and um, and uh, so people have tried to develop benchmarks to help people decide which one of the many data integration methods that are out there might be useful. Um, and we generally can learn based on our own experience or others' experience, which methods tend to work well. Um, so the one that most people have used here is called Harmony. And it turns out that that one is the one that's pretty popular right now. Um, it's probably used in most, most studies, I would guess. Um, I don't know if, uh, 
other instructors have have uh, other experience. But um, the reason why it um, so so in practice it, it works reasonably well. It's not always it's pretty good at in integrating. It doesn't overcorrect very much. It 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 can undercorrect, but generally it's working. It works pretty well. Um, it's also fast, um, and so usually people would recommend that as the first one to try. Um, and um, the way that it works is that it um, looks at these clusters and it, it tries to, you know, put them on top of each other in UMAP, if you just think about it like that. Um, and it, it, it iterates on trying to move these things together globally across the, the sample until eventually the clusters are on top of each other, like the cell types are on top of each other. And at, at that point, it's, you know, aligned the data and shifted things in a shifted the you know numbers in a way that those things are align. Um, and um, um, so, you know, following the general concept that I mentioned, um, a general another general concept that uh, and, uh, some methods use a number of methods use that's used in also, also a few popular methods in Surratt, for instance. Um, is this mutual nearest neighbor idea, um, where the um, you basically um, like if these are different cell types in two different samples, batch one and batch two, you try to find the cells that are mutually nearest across the sample. So um, cells X will like one of these cells. If you follow the line, will be most similar to this other cell. So. X cell, you know, one is most similar to X prime cell one. Um, and so you, the way that you figure that out is you compare all the cells from one sample to the other one. Like I, I, I'm a cell, I look at all the other cells in the other sample. So I'm a cell in sample A, and I look at all these cells in sample B, and I say, which one's my closest by just Pearson correlation or something like that. And you do the same thing in the other direction, from B to A. And if the, the, if they match, if they're like, you know, both those cells were, the, were each other's best neighbor across from A to B or B to A, then it's mutual nearest neighbor. Um, and um, and so once you have those, then that, um, you know, identifies the matching cell types um, that should be moved together. And then there are these correction vectors that get applied to push them together they get figured out. Um, canonical correlation analysis is another one. I mentioned that this is one of the ones that can over, uh, that experience shows can overcorrect. Um, so it's considered a harsh method, might be good for tougher integration problems. So the way that it works is it um, tries to kind of align the uh, all the cells and then uses something called dynamic time warping to like align them. It's just one of the um, uh, method that exists in computer science for you know, doing this type of alignment. So they chose that one to implement for canonical correlation analysis. Um, and um, RPCA is the, you know, newer version that our Surratt would recommend instead of CCA. Um, it's, it's generally less harsh and performs well. So this is a, a reasonable one to try as well. Um, and it um, uses this mutual, nearest, mutual neighborhood uh, idea. Um, or mutual nearest neighbors. Um, Liger, um, you know, I don't know if I would, in, I, I might drop the slide eventually, but um, it's an interesting method uh, that, well, I guess it's it's still interesting. I don't think, I don't know if people are using it as much anymore, but um, it's a little bit different than some of the other um, methods because it can integrate multi-omic data and it doesn't need the same cell types to be present in all the samples. Um, like the other methods don't require the same cell types to be present in all the samples, but the more common information there is across samples, the better. Um, and in this Liger method, you don't necessarily need that. Um, so it can, it can specifically output features that are data set or sample specific uh, or data set specific if it's multi-omics. Um, so um, okay, and then those are all those are all different uh, examples of automatic data integration methods, and 
you can imagine, you can kind of think about them as unsupervised, like they figure out themselves how to um, do the alignment um, and the integration. There's also a supervised version of it called reference-based alignment. So there's kind of two major types of alignment of integration, sorry, I'm saying alignment, um, uh, uh, of integration methods. Uh, there's this, the common one that people use like Harmony, kind of unsupervised and this reference-based integration method that currently is not used that frequently, but um, has some advantages. So, um, so, so some of the, um, so, so the way that this works is that you have a, a, a a reference map. So we know, let's say we know what the liver, like we have a really good map of all the liver cells. Um, and now I have another liver sample. So I've verified this map, I've published it, other people have verified it with other publications. We're pretty sure that the cells are really nicely annotated and high quality. Um, and so now instead of just, you know, integrating all my previous data with the new data, the new sample I have, well, why don't I trust that map a little bit and, and just map my new sample onto it? Um, and so um, that is uh, the way that, that the idea for reference-based integration. And um, uh, it's it has some uh, advantages. And the main one is that it's fast um, and you don't have to like recompute all of these things that those other integration methods are doing. It's just quickly mapping all the cells to so their similar cells in the reference. And so sometimes those other integration methods don't work if you have very big data sets. Um, the Human Cell Atlas project is making atlases of a lot of different tissues now. And I heard just last week that the immune cell atlas is gonna be reaching 26 million cells. Um, and that is hard, very, very difficult to integrate that much data. So um, the, uh, but reference-based integration works well. Um, so over time that, you know, we'll see. So right now it's, 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 um, less used. It's not very, it's not, um, it has, some, so, so yeah. So the, the, the advantage of it is that it's fast and it doesn't matter how many cells you have. This is disadvantages is it requires this reference-based map, which you might not have. And the, you know, new sample needs to be similar to that. Um, so it has to be you know, you have to have a map for every tissue or every disease that you're studying, um, a reference map. Uh, so, you know, I don't know why uh, it's it's a little bit less used, um, probably for those lim because of those limitations. Um, and it's not, I haven't seen it as benchmarks. I don't know if anyone else has seen reference-based mapping benchmarks yet, but um, so we don't know if there's different among different methods, if one's working better than another. But there are some nice examples. Uh, the people that make Surat, um, uh, Rahul Satija's lab, um, makes a tool called Azimuth that has a bunch of reference data sets already. Uh, and you can map your data to those if you have happen to be using, like working on the same tissue. Um, and there's another one. Um, and uh, how's my... Timing, yeah, or is near yeah, here? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, okay, so how do we know which integration methods good? I mentioned there's lots of them. Um, people have benchmarked these methods, and one of the kind of cottage industries in computational biology is benchmarking. Whenever there's a bunch of methods, there's another paper that comes out benchmarking those methods, and then another you know, more and more come out after that. So this, um, uh, but they, they end up being useful. So one was published in 2020 that benchmarked 14 methods and said, Harmony, Liger, and Surat 3 are recommended. Um, and actually Harmony is the first one that's recommended because it's fast. Um, and then another benchmark came out a couple of years later that benchmarked 20 methods and said, ScanV, Scanorama, SCVI, and SCGen perform well, particularly on complex integration tasks. I didn't even mention Harmony, but you know, if you looked, you can see that Harmony is doing well. Um, and but the you know these methods probably work well too. This SCVI is used pretty frequently. Um, and then this just came out. I forgot to put the date here, but it just came out a little while ago. Um, and someone is um, testing these things a little bit more carefully and. Um, and found that 
you know, some of these methods actually um, altered the data in a way that they even introduced problems that weren't there before. And so that's not good. Um, but they found that Harmony was the one that was uh, consistently performed well in their tests. So, um, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why Harmony is, is popular is because people keep on finding it uh, doing well in these various benchmarks. Um, there's a few different ways that these just, you know, probably won't use these uh, um, methods, these metrics yourself, maybe, but if you're reading a benchmark paper, just to, to see how or get a sense of how they're uh, evaluating these methods. So um, there's a, a range of metrics that they've come up with. So, um, you know, uh, conservation of biological variants, which is that, you know, uh, thing that I've been mentioning over time that the, the you know, you shouldn't mess up the biological signals in the data. Um, and then also um, uh, the, um, the, the batch effects or technical factors should be provably removed. So they have different methods for testing those things, different metrics. Um, some other, you know, the, this later benchmark paper can, you know, added a few more biological signals like cell cycle conservation highly variable gene conservation, trajectory conservation. Um, so the, the, the batch, the data integration method shouldn't mess those up. Um, and then they, they publish these tables like this, so you can see how they do in all these different uh, um, type, types of tasks and how fast they are and that kind of thing. Um, so um, I mentioned that sometimes the you have a lot, a lot of cells and then the data integration is difficult. Um, if that happens, you will need a computer with a lot of memory to store the data in memory and work on it. Um, sometimes you might need to move from R to Python, which is a little bit more memory efficient, or that reference-based integration may be needed. And there's lots of research in developing these integration methods, especially new deep learning methods. So over time, you know, things are improving and, um, you know, hopefully, dropping down the, the uh, you know, resources needed as well. Um, and uh, just a couple of extra notes. Um, so a lot of people ask, well, how does differential expression testing and data integration relate? Because, um, you know, after I integrate my data, I might see, I might remove my batch effect. So I, I should now remove my batch, I, I shouldn't have my batch effect interfere with my differential gene expression analysis. Um, but most of the popular methods don't, for data integration, don't produce a corrected cell by gene matrix that you can work with. Um, instead, they update, um, you know, a principal component map or something that you can use for clustering. And so your clusters will be updated, your cells will be grouped differently. And then a lot of people go back and, um, you know, uh, um, compare those groupings, but based on the original different uh, gene expression values that were not corrected. Um, and, um, you know, there are some ways of doing the correction and this is getting better over time as well. Um, so some of the methods that are, you know, like my correct sample bias directly in the, in the method at the single cell level are listed here. Um, the, you know, a lot of times people pseudo bulk the, as you, I think we were discussing already in the in the workshop, they pseudo bulk the clusters, and just the fact that the new the data integration method will give you different clusters and not integrating it, um, you know that that will be better than, um, you know, do uh, do computing differential expression in the pseudo bulk of the clusters after integration than before, um, but you know, um, and and Tulila I think talked about this in, in module five. A little bit. So um, in bulk RNA seq, it was easier um, because usually, I mean, these, these standard methods like edge R and D seq naturally had uh, factors that you can add to uh, compute the, you know, um, uh, to add the uh, sample, for instance, as an effect to be regressed out when you're doing the differential expression. And that was done at the sample level, but in Single cell RNA seq. A lot of people are doing the pseudo bulk thing. Um, all of these methods can be, um, you know, can work at the single cell level 
like in single cell RNA seq. The problem with these these edge RD seq is that they don't scale. So they they work with hundreds of samples. I don't know actually how many, but they don't work with million with like thousands of cells or tens of thousands of cells. Um, so that was why they, they're not used. So um this is not as streamlined as it could be these days, but it's getting better. So it's just good to be uh, aware of it. Um, okay, so um, any more questions before we end and summarize? Okay, I'll just quickly summarize. So, so just as a recap, we um, it's it's really good to verify if your data actually needs data integration before applying it. Uh, if you know if you don't, you need to you should keep it simple as a standard um, approach in science. Um, Sometimes merging the data is sufficient as uh, to support this joint analysis of many samples, um, like it was in the liver sample uh, paper that I mentioned. Um, you can detect batch effects and remove them, and the result can be checked. Uh, so you can evaluate the result to make sure that you remove the batch effect. Um, and so if anyone asks you if you have a batch effect in your data, you can say yes or no. And you can back, you can back that up with, you know, evidence. Um, and um, it is, there's some risk associated with it uh, over an undercorrection. Um, and, um, you know, Harmony is a good place to, to start, but sometimes you have to try more than one. So I think that some, uh, someone mentioned earlier that you tried more than one. Um, and in that, uh, in both of those reviewer rebuttal comments, we had to try more than one to convince the reviewers um, sometimes people would say, oh, you used Harmony, but what about, you know, this other favorite method that I like? Um, I think it's better than Harmony. And so you have to just convince people sometimes. But um, it's uh, um, good to be aware of some of the other ones in, in that case. Um, so, uh, yeah, fun fact, there's this paper from 1990 published in Toronto. It's actually the first single cell paper. They just did one cell. Um, so I, I like to tell people that single cell was invented in one of these buildings near here. <laughs> but, uh, and it's been around for a long time.